Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. In this video, we'll be starting Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry, its teachings, rules, laws, and present usages, which govern the order at the present day. True Masonry and the Universal Brotherhood of Man are one. By Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer, author of the Rosicrucians, their teachings, and the philosophy of fire. Dedication to Henry J. Barton, M.D., the American Deputy, Thos Benjamin Omeko, and Professor A.F. Davis of Far Off Africa, and to those Masonic brethren who have helped to make this work possible, to that fraternity who has been the life of the work in the past as at the present, and above all, to that one who has been the guiding star of my work. Is this book lovingly dedicated? R. Swinburne Clymer. Introductory. In placing the present work before the public, I have no apology whatever to offer, and this for several reasons. First, because I have been ordered to prepare it, and second, because much of what I herein give is not new, for the simple reason that there can be nothing new in masonry. True, many a thing, especially what concerns mystic masonry, has not been given to the profane people, but this is not to say that it is new, for it is not. I know that the present work will stand unchallenged as to the truth it contains. And this for the reason that I quote from the highest Masonic authorities in the world, and that which concerns mystic masonry comes directly from him who knows and who has no superior in this work. I also know that I would not be accused of stealing, for the very good reason that I give credit for every single quotation, unless it was changed. With these facts before me, I can feel well satisfied to let it go forward. There are several reasons why this book should go before the people, and especially before Masons themselves. Too little is known by my brother Masons concerning that order to which they have the honor to belong, but which some of them do not honor, and the present work, prepared from the highest authorities, will give them some idea of what the underlying principle of their teachings is. It also has become necessary to let the world know that mystic masonry exists and has existed for many years, although not always under that name. Not much can be said concerning the order, for the reason that even its degrees may not become known to a profane world. Craft masons can learn all they desire concerning it, provided they are willing to pay the price, not in current coin, but in their duty and in work. Initiation is not what is generally supposed to be. All Masons know what ceremonial initiation is, but this is simply the outward symbol of the inner work. A Mason who has the three degrees may think that he has all that can be had, but little does he know of that inner work, that grand and supreme initiation which is possible for those who truly desire it. Thousands of good men take the letter for the spirit, and it is in doing this where the misunderstanding begins. Nothing new can come to masonry, but there is a world of truth in masonry that the vast majority know nothing whatever about. And it is for this reason that the present work is placed before the public and especially before all brother masons, and it is sent forth in such a manner that it cannot be denied. For as stated before, it is from the highest authorities among all Masons. As regarded to the true initiation, I would quote from the work of Master Mason Dr. J.D. Buck, in which he says, initiation and regeneration are synonymous terms. The ritual of Freemasonry is based on this natural law, and the ceremony of initiation illustrates at every step this principle. And if the result attained is a position rather than a regeneration, in the great majority of cases, the principle remains nonetheless true. The mere inculcation of moral principles or lessons in ethics and their symbolic illustrations and dramatic representation are by no means in vain, 
These appeal to the conscious and moral sense in every man, and no man has ever been made worse by the lessons of the Lodge. By these rights and benefits, the Mason is, above all men, in our so-called modern civilization, the nearest to the ancient wisdom. He has possession of the territory in which he concealed the crown jewels of wisdom. He may content himself, if he will, by merely turning over the sod and gathering only a crop of husk or stubble. He may dig deeper and find not only the keystone of the arch, the Ark of the Covenant, the scroll or the law, but using the spirit concealed in the wings of the cherubim, he may rise untrembled by the rubbish of the temple and meeting Elohim face to face, learn also to say, I am that I am. Does this read like a rhapsody? And are the landmarks, traditions, and glyphics of Freemasonry nothing more? And again, the universal science and sublime philosophy once taught in the greater mysteries of Egypt, Chaldea, Persia, and India, and among many other nations of antiquity, is a dead letter in modern Freemasonry? The intelligent Mason, however, should be the last person in the world to deny that such wisdom once existed. For the simple reason, the whole superstructure of Freemasonry is built upon the traditions of its existence, and its ritual serves as its living monument. Proficiency in the proceeding degree is wherever made a reason for advancement in Masonry. This proficiency is made to consist in the ability of the candidate to repeat word for word certain rituals and obligations already passed, the meaning and explanations of which constitute the lectures in the various degrees. The usage at this point, in the United States at least, serves rather to secure the rights and benefits of the Lodge to those entitled to them, and to withhold them from others, than to advance the candidate in real knowledge. For this very reason, the present work is placed before all those who would know. Mystic Masonry also has its rituals and its laws, but it makes the spirit of more value than the letter and will, and will teach its candidates the spirit as well as the letter. For in its higher degrees, the man must bring out that which is in him if he desires to advance. In this way, the real initiate does not only become a possibility, but a fact, and none can advance unless they do the work. Besides this, mystic masonry does what craft masonry should do. It binds its men into one universal brotherhood in which they must treat each other as brothers if they desire to remain in the order. This is not a dream, but a reality. Says Dr. Buck again, we do not know a thing because we are told so. Let the gods shout the truth of all the ages into the ears of a fool forever, and still forever the fool would be joined to his folly. Here lies the conception and the principle of all initiations. It is knowledge unfolded by degrees in an orderly, systematic manner, step by step. As the capacity to apprehend opens in the neophyte, the result is not a possession but a growth, an evolution. Knowledge is not a mere sum in addition, something added to something that already exists, but rather such a progressive change or transformation of the original structure as to make it, at every step, a new being. Real knowledge, or the growth of wisdom in man, is an eternal becoming a progressive transformation into the likeness of the supernatural goodness and the supreme power. In a work of this nature, not too much can be said as regard the supreme initiation. And those who may be truly interested, I would refer to the Rosicrucians, their teachings, and to the philosophy of fire, both of which contain chapters on the true initiation. 99 Masons out of every 100 would laugh at the occult science. And yet, were it not for the occult fraternities, Masonry could never have existed. The secret doctrine was the universal diffused religion of the ancients and prehistoric world. 
proof of its diffusion, authentic records of its history, a complete chain of documents showing its character and presence in every land, together with the teaching of all its great adepts, exist to this day in the secret crypts of libraries belonging to the occult fraternities. The Rosicrucian fraternity, more than any other, is to be thanked for keeping this secret and sacred writings intact. Although individual members of this fraternity have been persecuted in many lands and during all centuries, the order or fraternity as such has never been persecuted nor has there been any interruption. This fraternity, therefore, has been able to continue without interruption the teachings of the secret doctrine and ancient mysteries no matter what the order, whether masonry or mystic masonry, no matter the name, it has always been found that Rosicrucians had the work in hand. History proves this. It cannot be successfully denied, and none but those who are ignorant try to deny it. Every soul must work out its own salvation. Salvation by faith and the vicarious atonement were not taught, as now interpreted by Jesus, nor are these doctrines taught in the exoteric scriptures. They are later and ignorant perversions of the original doctrines. In the early church, as in the secret doctrine, there was not one Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in every man. Theologians first made a fetish of the impersonal, omnipresent divinity, and then tore the Christos from the hearts of all humanity in order to deify Jesus, that they might have a God made peculiarly their own. Masonry does not teach salvation by faith, nor the vicarious atonement. Go through the degrees, study the history as taught by its greatest masters, and you cannot find that it teaches this doctrine. Boldly do I claim that this doctrine does not make Christians, but it does make criminals. The reason for this is plain. All the ancient mysteries had the true doctrine, and so had the early Christians. Masonry, before it was contaminated by the disciples of Loyola, the Jesuits, had it also. It is for Masons to bring out the good and the true from the rubbish. Says Brother Buck again, humanity in toto is the only personal God. The Christos is the realization or the perfection of this divine persona in individual conscious experience. When this perfection is realized, the state is called Christos. With the Greeks and the Buddha, with the Hindus, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Then, my brother, if Christ and Buddha are one and the same, why condemn you those that follow the Buddha. Know you not that they who follow the Buddha follow the same Christ as you under, but another name. We have brought the same selfishness into our religion that we indulge in regard to our other possessions, such as wife and children, and houses, and land and country, and this same partisan spirit as in our politics, and this more than anything else appears to justify selfishness in general, militates against the brotherhood of man and prevents the founding of the great republic composed of many nations and all people. This idea of universal brotherhood, which was a cardinal doctrine in the ancient mysteries as it is involved in the first postulate of the secret doctrine and openly declared in the third, and which is equally given the very first rank in true masonry, is the logical deduction from our idea of divinity and of the essential nature and meaning of Christos. In mystic masonry, the idea of the universal brotherhood of man is one of the supreme laws and a cardinal principle. Before the candidate can start out in even the first degree of mystic oriental masonry, he must subscribe to the rules of a universal brotherhood. And this is not a dead letter, for the secret code will see to it that he not only obligates to treat all other members of the order as brothers,
but that he will do it. There is no exception to this rule. All alike must obey it or pay the natural penalty. There can be no exceptions to this rule. Brother for brother and not brother against brother. We live or die together. Masonry, nor mystic masonry, does not preach a new religion, but reiterates the new commandment announced by Jesus, which was also announced by every great reformer or religion since history began. Drop the theological barnacles from the religion of Jesus, as taught by him and by the Essenes and Gnostics of the first centuries, and it becomes mystic masonry. Masonry in its purity, derived as it is from the old Kabbalah, as a part of the great universal wisdom religion of the remotest antiquity, stands squarely for the unqualified and universal brotherhood of man, in all times and in every age, to Christianized masonry, or to narrow it to the sectarian bonds of any creed. It is not only to dwarf and belittle it, but most inevitably result as among warring sects has always resulted with religion in sitting brother against brother and lodge against lodge. Mystic masonry can recognize neither color nor creed and in that lies its safety and through this will it gradually bring about the universal brotherhood of man. It not only teaches this, but all those who belong to it must practice it. Is there not a wave of brotherhood sweeping over every land? Do not the reports show that this work is spreading as never before? What then is to prevent it from growing larger and larger until the majority will subscribe to brotherhood? The fiat is cast, the results are sure. So long as the lower mind is held in bondage by desire, man cannot seek or discern the good or the true. He inquires, what is good for me? Free from desire or personal bias, he inquires after and seeks for that which is good or true in itself. When this condition is reached and habitually maintained, the square is said to be enclosed in the triangle. The lower nature is said to be at one with the divine or spiritual soul. Man's knowledge and power are no longer confined to or circumscribed by the lower plane or the physical body, but transcending these by regeneration or self-conquest and becoming perfect in humanity, man attains divinity. This is the meaning, aim, and consummation of human evolution, and this philosophy defines the one only process by which it may be attained. The perfect man is Christ, and Christ is God. This is the birthright and destiny of every human soul. It was taught in all the greater mysteries of antiquity, but the exoteric creeds of Christendom derived from the parables and allegories in which this doctrine was concealed from the ignorant and the profane, have accorded this supreme consummation to Jesus alone, and made it obscure or impossible for all the rest of humanity. In place of this, the grandest doctrine ever revealed to man, theologians have set up salvation by faith in a man-made creed, and the authority of the church to bind or loosen on earth or in heaven. Law is annulled, justice dethroned, merit ignored, effort discouraged, and sectarianism, atheism, and materialism are the results. All real initiation is an internal, not an external process. The outer ceremony is dead and useful only so far as it symbolizes and illustrates and thereby makes clear the inward change. To transform means to regenerate, and this comes by trial, by effort, by self-conquest, by sorrow, disappointment, failure, and a daily renewal of the conflict. It is thus man must work out his own salvation. 
The consummation of initiation is the finding of the Christos. The problem of genuine initiation or training in occultism consists in placing all the operations of the body under the dominion of the will, in freeing the ego from the dominion of the appetites, passions, and the whole lower nature. The idea is not to despise the body, but to purify it or transmute it. Not to destroy the appetites, but to elevate and control them, absolutely. And this is known in alchemy as the transmutation. This mastery of the lower nature does not change the key of the physical nature as such, but subordinates it to that of a higher plane. Without this subordination, the clamorous lower animal nature drowns out all higher vibrations. As if in an orchestra, the bass vowels and the drums only could be heard, and noise rather than harmony results. Hence the saying, he that conquers himself is greater than he who taketh a city. Says Dr. Buck, while every true mason is the most loyal of men to every office of a woman as mother, sister, daughter, and wife, as companion, friend, and inspirer of man, he would have been trampled by her presence in the lodge, and she would receive no benefit by being admitted. When, however, the days of ritualism alone are ended, when from the one duty of guarding the altars and lighting the campfires, Masonry resumes its prerogative as teacher and enlightener of mankind, and the philosophy of nature and of life are unfolded in its schools and colleges as with the Magi of old, and when with no fear of persecution for time-serving potentate or creed-ridden priest, the light may shine for all. Then will the doors of real initiation be as open to women as to men, as was the case in the schools of Pythagoras as shown by Amblichus. The ancient wisdom concerned itself largely with the souls of men and undertook to elevate the earthly life by purifying the soul and exalting its ideals. It's teaching that souls are sexless and that the sex of the body is an incident of gestation. No civilization known to man has ever risen to any great heights or long maintained its supremacy that debased women. Indeed, the secret doctrine demonstrates with unmistakable clearness that sexual debasement in any form is the highway to degeneracy and destruction of both men and women, and of nations, quite as certainly as of individuals. When Brother Buck penned the above, he could not have been more aware of the fact that the Rosicrucian fraternity accepted women on an equal footing as men in all degrees. It is for this very reason that the Rosicrucian fraternity has been able to go unmolested when other orders were persecuted. It is also for this reason that the Catholic Church has been able to bring to its fold almost as many men and women as nearly all other churches combined. They recognize the mother principle in deity and know that man and woman the twine are one. Mystic masonry recognizes this same principle, and while it cannot admit women to its ceremonial initiation, provisions are made whereby they can reach as high as can men. This is a wise plan, a plan founded by those who know, and who know why the Rosicrucian fraternity is as strong and as solid as it is. While Mary Magdalena could not be a disciple of Jesus and could not travel with him and his other disciples, yet she could be taught in secret by him and when all others, his most trusted disciples, swore that they did not know him, Mary, the woman, did not fear to stand by him. Let mystic masons remember. The author. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you very much.